If you have your Bibles, would you please turn to Nehemiah chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 1 through 3 this afternoon. And this is a very personal message for me. It's something that the Lord has really, I feel, spoken to me. It's very raw for me. And I hope that the Holy Spirit, through the living word of God, ministers to you as well. There is no doubt some of you here today that are extremely discouraged. You're maybe even contemplating, you know, throwing in the towel, quitting it all. There's some of you here today that need to be reminded that what the Lord has called you to do with your life and in your family is very, very important and that you shouldn't quit. There are some of you today that are battling depression or loneliness or feeling down. You need to be encouraged in the Lord to not allow the enemy to bring you down. If you look at verse 1 of, of, of uh, Nehemiah chapter 6, it says, Now it happened, and this is Nehemiah writing, that when Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at the time, Nehemiah inserts here parenthetically, I had not hung the doors and the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messengers, verse 3, to them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask that you would give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to your church. I pray for those that are discouraged, Lord, that you would encourage them. I pray for those that feel like they're sinking with the weights of the pressures of this world, that you would lift them up. And Lord, may we leave here filled afresh with your Holy Spirit and further equipped for the work of the ministry that you've called us to be a part of. And we commit this time to you now. Would you add your blessing to the reading and to the study of your word? And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. See, the enemy, if you didn't notice this already, he went after Nehemiah because he was the leader. And if the enemy can get the leader, then he can get the leader's followers. It's important to understand that the devil will attack you before you get started. He'll attack you when you're halfway through, and he'll even attack you at the end when the work has been completed. Now, we've heard of Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, but the list didn't stop there. Did you notice how it was inserted, at, inserted there where he says that the rest of his enemies heard about the work that he was doing? For each of us, filled with the Holy Spirit, exercising our faith, you will run into opposition. Sir Winston Churchill said this, and I quote, you have enemies? Good. That means you've stood up for something sometime in your life. End of quote. For those of you that might be classified as a younger person, please pay attention. The enemy would like to ruin a lifetime before it even gets started. For those of you that might be more established and you're in the middle, so to speak, the enemy would love to ruin what is behind you and what is ahead of you. And finally, please be aware that the enemy would also like to ruin a lifetime of walking with the Lord at the end of one. With Nehemiah, we read that his enemies, all of them, had heard about his work for the Lord, the rebuilding of the wall. You know, it fascinates me when I read of Nehemiah's enemies catching wind of his work for the Lord, because it prompted a question that I asked myself. I asked myself, I wondered, what's more important, to be known in Christian circles or in the enemy's camp? that I'm known amongst those that might profess Christianity, or if I'm known by the enemy. Well, I'd present to you today that it's more important to be known spiritually in the enemy's camp than to be known in a Christian circle. And the case in point would be from Acts chapter 19. There were these Jewish religious individuals, and they decided that they were going to exercise a demon in the name of Jesus that Paul preached. 
And I read for you in verse 13, you can turn there in Acts 19 if you like, but it says, then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. And also it says there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? And there are a lot of individuals, if you have not yet noticed this, that can be classified under the umbrella of a Christian influencer or a Christian this or that, but they are really the furthest thing from impacting the kingdom of darkness as you could be. And we read more here in Acts 19, verses 16 through 17. It says, Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known, verse 17, both to all Jews and all Greeks dwelling in Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. You cannot have a relationship with Jesus vicariously through your pastor or through your aunt or through your parent or through your grandmother. Unless you're empowered by the Holy Spirit, you are powerless. We are powerless against the enemy. See, Jesus is known by the enemy. Paul was known by the enemy. But what if I asked you, what about you here today? Are you known? Because if you are following the Lord, sooner or later, if you're serving the Lord, the enemy will catch wind of it. They'll find out. There you are trying to honor the Lord in your marriage, and Satan will try to destroy it. There you are as parents trying to raise your children unto the Lord, and Satan will try to disrupt it. There you are trying to be a light in a dark place, and Satan will try to diminish it. the enemy will get wind because there's a spiritual battle that is happening. And we are known in the spiritual realm. Think of the prophet Elisha. There's a fascinating story in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 11 and 12 is where I'll read from you, but the context is this. Syria was warring against Israel. And every time the king of, uh, of Syria planned an ambush or set up a camp to wage war on Israel, Israel will be in the complete opposite direction. Other end of the town. And every single time there was a trap set, they would somehow avoid it. And it got to the point that this happened so often that in verse 11 we read that the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? Which one of you are spies? You're giving them all the information about where we're going to be. And one of his servants replied and said, none of us are spies, O king, but it's Elijah. Elijah the prophet, that man of God, he's in Israel and God speaks to him. God reveals things to him. God uses him. He even goes on to say the servant of the king of Syria says, the prophet Elisha tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. That is a pretty intimate understanding. But I don't know about you, but for me, I'm thrilled at the thought of foiling the enemy's plans to destroy our children. I'm thrilled at the thought of baffling the enemy's work through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit at work through his church. You and me, filled with the Holy Spirit, victorious over sin, busy about our Father's business, doing the work of the Lord. If I could ask you a series of questions, and if you feel like you'd like to reply, that's fine. You can do so by raising your hand. But how many of you here deal with a lot of stress in your job? There's a lot of you. How many of you have ever felt lonely or isolated or without real friends? Time to time, sure. 
How many of you, and this might be more of a touchy subject, have felt the strain of how to deal with politics correctly with family and church? Interesting. How many of you have ever felt like it's been a challenge to move forward in your relationship with the Lord? Like, I just feel stuck. You know, this is a rough patch that I'm going through. Did you know those same questions were asked the pastors? The same questions. A survey was done amongst pastors who quit the ministry. They just said, you know what, I'm done. I'm not doing it anymore. Did you know that that first question, we see the answer to it as being 56% of pastors quit because of the immense stress of the job. 56 43% quit because they felt lonely or isolated or without real friends. 38% of pastors quit the ministry due to current political divisions. And then the answers to the questions four and five, 29% quit because of the negative effect on their family and that the church wasn't going anywhere. They felt like they were stuck in a rut. Family problems because of our faith in Jesus, our view as being a biblical worldview has caused us great difficulty. And it would seem just by the show of hands across this audience today that many of you understand the great challenges associated with following Jesus. But did you notice in our text this morning in Nehemiah 6 how the enemy wanted to meet with Nehemiah? Why? Why would the enemy want to meet with Nehemiah? Well, so he could discourage him from doing his work and eventually destroy him. Have you ever thought that maybe you meet with the enemy and the thoughts in your mind? The fiery darts of the wicked one, those lies or those enticements, and, and you meet with the enemy there? Have you ever thought that maybe you're meeting with the enemy when you're sliding into those DMs you ought not to be sliding into? Have you ever thought that you are meeting with the enemy when you're in a place that you shouldn't be, where no good will come from it? Well, I'd like to highlight for you Nehemiah's response to his enemies, and hopefully you can own them for yourself. The first thing that we see that Nehemiah replies with is this, I am doing a great work. I'm doing a great work. The Lord's work is a great work regardless of how successful you may appear to be doing. But when you're struggling, it doesn't feel like, oh, this is a great work of the Lord. You know, when you're discouraged, it doesn't feel like it's a great work of the Lord. When you're lonely and feel isolated as if nobody else is going through what you're going through, it doesn't feel like the Lord's really a, a great work in your life. When you're not seeing the results that you thought you'd want to see or that you ought to see by now, it doesn't feel like it's a great work that you're a part of because all the great works of God take place in other people's lives. Well, look at that guy up there. Well, look at her over here. The Lord's working in her life, but look at me. I'm struggling. I'm having a hard time. Where is the Lord when I need him? You know, even pastors get discouraged. There's nothing quite like, you know, opening up your Sunday morning service and you say, good morning and welcome to church. It's so great to see both of you here today. <laughs> Mom, dad, appreciate the support. <laughs> it happens. And discouragement comes in all different shapes and forms. It comes in all different ways with all those who decide to follow the Lord. But Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And maybe today for you, just a simple word of encouragement would be that the work that you are doing, the life that you're living unto the Lord is important regardless of who may acknowledge it. That the Lord is at work even when you can't see it. Because if Satan can't get you with disobedience, he's going to try to get you with discouragement. And Satan doesn't seek to discourage those who are not about their father's business. So if you are seeking the Lord, if you're desiring to be who God's called you and created you to be, and you're about the work of the Lord in your life and in your marriage and in your family, don't be caught off guard 
if you face opposition. The second thing that we see Nehemiah emphatically stating is I cannot come down. The work I'm doing is great. It's a great work. It's the Lord's work. But then he says, I cannot come down. Come down, those two words are actually translated from the Hebrew language as they can mean to sink down or to sink. So Nehemiah noticed this, Christians, noticed this cornerstone. Nehemiah acknowledges that his work is important because it is the Lord's work. But from the original language, what we see is something very fascinating. When he says, I cannot come down or I cannot sink, this word, cannot, this couple, I cannot actually denotes the ability to resist sinking down. It speaks of having the power, the ability to say no. I will not come down from the place that the Lord has elevated me to because God forgave me of my sins. He filled me with his Holy Spirit. He set me free from the bondages of sin. He lifted me up to a place that was elevated. I'm busy about the work of the Lord and I will not sink down. I will not sink down. Little did I know that about six weeks ago, and I mentioned that this was very personal for me and pretty raw, but that about six weeks ago, the Lord began preparing this message for me. And I didn't understand at the time that the Lord would actually take one of the most difficult and painful situations in my life to bring me to a place where I would understand who he is in a deeper way. You know, honestly, I wish with all my heart that I could learn more about the Lord without having to go through difficulties. I wish, and, and, full dis, and in full disclosure as a pastor, I wish that my faith could grow immensely without ever having to use it. But unfortunately, that is not the case. From the scriptures, we see that Jesus was a man of sorrows. He was acquainted with grief. And often it is the case for us as Christians that we learn not only to be acquainted with grief, but what to do with it once we meet it. Exhaustion. And grief are such powerful tools in the hand of the enemy to work in the flesh. To get us to question God's love for us, to question his faithfulness, to question the truths that we know from God's word. But even greater than that tool in the hand of the enemy is it in the hand of our heavenly father at work through the Holy Spirit. You know, for some reason, and I mentioned earlier, you know, about my family, my wife, my kids, my second oldest child is our only girl, Ava. And she was born with special needs. And for some reason, she'll wake up between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. very upset and in pain. And the hard thing for us with, with Ava is that she's not able to speak, so she can't communicate, you know, what is what it is really that she's, you know, hurting from. And as a dad, it's one of the most difficult places to find yourself in when you're incapable of helping your little girl who clearly needs help. It's heartbreaking. And as I sat at the top of my stairs in the early hours of the morning, I was praying to the Lord for help. Like, Lord, can you just help? And I had these feelings of sorrow and anger and frustration as if God wasn't hearing my prayers. But all along, the Lord was listening and he was working and he revealed something to me through a prayer he put on my heart to pray and that prayer was very simple and it was very short and it went like this. Lord, show me the path to walk upon that I might glorify you in the most difficult of situations. Isn't it true that in family life, in your own personal life, there are so many things that are trying to bring you down, that the enemy tries to harness to get us to sink into, to lower you, 
But with the power of the living God at work in your life, you have the ability to refuse to be brought down by any circumstance, regardless of how painful it might be. Regardless of how difficult it might be. When everything in you is is crying out, just quit, just give in, it's over, I'm done, I've had it. That's where the Lord begins to show you who he truly is. And that ability comes from the Lord. And I discovered that every valley of shadow and death has a path of righteousness that weaves through it, a path upon which you can walk. That path, however, is hidden from physical perception because it is spiritually perceived. And the paving stones of that path of righteousness are illuminated by the word of God every step of the way. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow and death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. We often forget the verse that precedes that, which is, you lead me on the paths of righteousness for your name's sake. And sometimes, guys, it is true that the paths of righteousness lead through the valley of shadow and death. The third thing we see Nehemiah reply to the enemy with is this, if the work ceases, it's because I sink down. The work that the Lord has me involved with will stop if I'm brought down. And that's exactly it. It comes down to coming down. How does the coming down work for the Christian, the follower of Jesus? Depression brings you down. Distraction. Hey, what's going on over here? What's going on over there? What are they doing? And we lose focus of what we're supposed to be doing. We're no longer looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We're looking at our problem that's surrounding us. Discontentment brings you down. Especially with social media, before it was called keeping up with the Joneses. Now you just hop on your phone and look at the highlight reels of everybody else around the world. And you think, how come my life doesn't look as good as theirs? Discontentment. You lose sight of the Lord and how much he's blessed you with. And of course, disobedience brings you down. The work ceasing and your destruction are the last parts of a Christian coming down from the high place of holiness, from the high place of serving unto the Lord, giving unto the Lord, participating in the work of the Lord. The last part of it is destruction. You know, just at first glance, I notice that a lot of younger people here, you're just starting out in life. You're charging ahead. Please beware of comparison. Watch out. But comparison bringing discontentment is nothing new. Even Jesus addressed it with Peter in John 21, verses 21 through 22. We read Peter seeing this other man that was there with them, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this guy? And Jesus replied and said, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. What a word from the Lord when we begin to become discouraged or because our life doesn't look like somebody else's life. You know, we need to watch out. What a great rule of thumb this is. How about you do what God's called you to do and let them do what God's called them to do? You stay focused on the Lord. You serve the Lord. There are some of you here today, you're in the middle of your life. You're more established. You're not just starting out, but you're established. Please beware of exhaustion. It's easy to get worn out. You know, raising children in all stages of their lives, it can be a very, very big adventure and a very big challenge. And there really aren't any books that you can read to prepare you for your own kids. You just kind of make it up as you go with the first kid and apologize to him later and try to get better as you go. (laughs) It's true. 
But beware of exhaustion. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3 says, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Speaking of Jesus. He says, consider Jesus, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Now, when I was a younger man, I struggled with how there were couples that were in the middle of their life. They had raised their kids. I grew up with their kids. We hung out, we were in each other's houses, we spent the night, we did sports, we went to school, and their kids grew up, graduated high school, finished college, and then the parents got divorced. And it was heartbreaking. And there are those that you have looked up to for a long time that just didn't want to handle things the right way, because sometimes handling things the right way is a lot more difficult than handling things the wrong way. And it's sad. Please stay disciplined. You're so focused on raising your kids and getting them up and out that you neglect your marriage, you neglect your relationship with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, it says, but I discipline my body, Paul writes, and I bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Well, if we raise them unto the Lord and then I disqualified myself. I preached to thousands of people and people gave their life to the Lord and they were blessed because of the teaching of God's word and then I disqualify myself. For the sake of all the young people that you don't even realize that look up to you, do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Don't cut corners. Don't forsake the truths of the scriptures when it comes to even practical things because we need you to keep going strong. We need you to keep blazing the trail so that we can follow in your footsteps. That it's not good enough just to be a good godly mom and dad. Be a good godly grandparent or great-grandparent. Because Satan wants to trip you up before you even get started. He'll attack you when you're halfway through. And he even try to get you at the end. And there are some of you today, you are at the end and you're passing the baton, so to speak. You have a legacy. You have a reputation of being a godly man or a godly woman. Please do not let your guard down. At the time of great illness, King Hezekiah cried out to the Lord in Isaiah 38 verse 3. And as he prayed to the Lord, he said, Lord, remember now, I pray how I have walked before you in truth and with a loyal heart, and have done what is good in your sight. And it says that Hezekiah wept bitterly. May it be for you, as it was for Hezekiah, where he looks back on his life, and he says, Lord, I have walked before you in truth. My heart was loyal to you, and I have done what is good in your sight. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And it's heartbreaking for me because there are a lot of disqualifications taking place right now. I wonder if this message is preempting any disqualifications that might be near to taking place in this auditorium today. Finish strong. Stay strong. We all need you to do so. We're seeing how in an instant, reputations vanish. Don't allow that to happen because you are the pillars upon which future generations stand upon. For those of you that might have been able to relate to the guy sitting at the top of his stairs, praying to the Lord, asking if you even hear my prayer, It may seem as if the Lord is not hearing your prayers or seeing your plight. But please listen to me carefully. He is very well aware of what's happening and he is very much at work in your life through the trial you're currently in. The reality is, is that we often don't see it. The temptation is because I don't see Jesus at work, then it must not be happening. In John 20, verse 29 Jesus said, well, you believe because you have seen me, but blessed are those who believe without seeing me. That's a little thing called faith. 
the work that the Lord is doing in you, in your marriage, in your family, and in your ministry is a great work, and you're a part of that great work. So don't allow anything that the wicked one may hurl at you to cause you to sink down. It may hurt. Nobody said that following Jesus was going to be easy. Jesus himself said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world, and greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. That is a promise for all of us. And so even as Nehemiah, and as we conclude our brief time together, Nehemiah didn't go and meet with the enemy. He said, the work that I'm doing is a great work because it's the Lord's work. I have the ability through the power of the Holy Spirit at work in my life. I don't have to sink into sin. I don't have to sink into discouragement. I don't have to be overcome by anything that this world may attack me with. But it might hurt. It might be challenging, but we have the power of the Holy Spirit enabling us each day to overcome. Don't sink down. Don't give up. Don't quit. You may not see it. You might wonder if it's being effective you might be trying to be a better spouse or a better parent and you're not seeing immediate results. You have to understand that the devil wants you to stop pursuing holiness and righteousness in everything that you do. And thus you must fall back on. Let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, I shall reap if I don't lose heart. And if you don't lose heart... And if you don't sink down, and if you don't disobey the Lord, and if you don't get distracted, then the great work that the Lord is doing in you and through you will not cease. So today, if you feel discouraged, if you feel like you've hit spiritual opposition, if you feel like you're being challenged or your stance for righteousness is being contested, good. It means you're actually standing up for something in your life. And there is not a greater cause to stand up for than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this church. We thank you, Lord, that you know each individual person that's not only here, in person, but those that are watching from wherever they may be watching. You have perfect knowledge of all things. And so, Lord, today, I ask that your Holy Spirit would move in the hearts of your sons and your daughters. That those that don't know you would come to know you. Those marriages that are struggling would be strengthened. Those families that are under attack would be, under attack would be galvanized through those difficulties, to trust in you with all of their hearts and to seek you first, your kingdom and your righteousness, knowing that all these other things will be added unto them. And so, Lord, we thank you. We praise you in faith, in advance for what you're going to do. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so even, Lord, if we don't see it right now, may our hope be in you and you alone. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all Cornerstone Chapel says, amen. Let's all stand. And as was the custom for my pastor, Chuck Smith, who is now home with the Lord, I'd like to leave you with this. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious unto you. And may he lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in Jesus' name. Amen.